Welcome to part three. Before we wrap up the retrospective, I want to address two things. First, Double Dash really is the most controversial game in the series, but you guys have really impressed me with your comments on it so far. Whether you agreed or disagreed, I feel like everyone actually has been mature and insightful. I could say it's just because the channel is still pretty small, but I think it's also because my fans are the most awesome people on the internet. Also, I wanted to address a trifecta of games I can't really say much about, the Mario Kart Arcade GP series. These titles were released exclusively in arcades. Since they were developed by Namco, they don't count toward the official series. I know I played the second game in an arcade years ago, and it was fun, but I really can't go in-depth when I have so little experience. Given the work that went into them, I am pretty surprised they were never ported to Nintendo's consoles. Speaking of which, Mario Kart Wii was released on April 27th, 2008, and I barely noticed. This was the worst possible time in my life for such a multiplayer-focused game to hit the shelves. Not only had Super Smash Bros. Brawl been released less than two months earlier, my friends and I were just beginning our long-running obsession, bordering on romance, with Team Fortress 2. Caught between those two behemoths, Mario Kart Wii didn't really stand a chance. I did still play through all the Grand Prix around the time it came out, and it's probably become my most played Mario Kart in the years since. Man, was it ever deadlocked at first. Mario Kart Wii focused most of its marketing around the Wii Wheel, a plastic contraption you'd fit your Wii Remote into, which ostensibly made it feel like you were actually driving a car. In reality, nobody in their right mind would bother with it unless they had to. But in retrospect, it wasn't that bad. I mean, it wasn't nearly as good as literally any other option, but I mean, it worked. The Wii version finally showed off what creative, fun courses a more powerful system was capable of. They're more dynamic than ever. For the first time in the series, it didn't always feel like you were driving down a road with Mario-themed items strewn about. It sometimes felt like you were actually racing through the worlds, and that was really cool. And the retro courses became even greater. It wasn't just about bringing back nostalgic tracks. The retro courses were updated to take advantage of more powerful hardware and Mario Kart's new features. Speaking of, this game might as well have been called Mario Bike Wii, because as this footage shows, that's all most people used. It was a cool idea to have more than one type of racing vehicle, but bikes not only handled better, they could pop a wheelie on straightaways to gain a little speed. The only disadvantage to racing on a bike was that your drift boost couldn't be charged as much, which would have been much more of a hindrance in previous games, but Mario Kart Wii made a change. Since Mario Kart 64, you could charge a drift boost, which the series calls a mini turbo, by hopping into a drift and rocking the cart back and forth a few times. When you let go, you would gain a little boost of speed. But within Mario Kart DS's online community, there was a huge divide over the controversy of snaking. Basically, players would become so good at drifting, they'd snake back and forth along straightaways, firing off mini turbos as they went. Mario Kart should definitely be an accessible game, and snaking made for way too much of a divide between great players and the best players. So in Mario Kart Wii, and all subsequent games, mini turbos are charged by the length and sharpness of a drift. I think it was a change for the better, even though in this game it made the supposed advantage to racing a kart superfluous. On the not-so-bright side, races now featured 12 racers, up from the previous 8. They tried their best to make it work by widening the tracks and changing the scoring system, but 4 more racer slots also means 4 more item slots, and that made Mario Kart Wii more chaotic than ever. Still, it was pretty cool to race against that many characters, and it tended to be an enjoyable sort of chaos. This brings us to the newest game in the franchise, at least for one more day. Unfortunately, I have no easy way to record my own footage of it. But when I decided I might do a Mario Kart retrospective, this was the first game I picked up, and I was immediately struck by how oddly unfamiliar it seemed. And then I looked at the release date, and it all made sense. December 4th, 2011. What, was I too busy playing Skyrim? Oh, heavens no. This was barely a month after the release of Sonic Generations, which was taking up so much of my time back then, it's no wonder I didn't remember it well. But I did play Mario Kart 7 when it came out. I just barely gave it any time or consideration beyond a cursory glance, and so it didn't have much of a chance to make an impression. I'm happy to say that whether this retrospective series makes the Geek Critique famous or not, I'm really glad I did it just for the opportunity to give Mario Kart 7 another shot. 7 brought in some fresh innovations. Karts were way more customizable than before, as you'll unlock not only different vehicles, but different wheels and gliders as you play. Wait, gliders? Yeah, karts can now glide through the air and travel underwater. 
These features take a lot of flack for not being as encompassing, I guess, as the different vehicles in Sega All-Stars Racing or even Diddy Kong Racing. And yeah, they're not. But it's not really a fair comparison, especially when they're implemented so well. In previous games, courses would have set pieces where you'd get blasted over to a new section of track. They looked cool, but they tended to lock you out of control. The gliders changed what was a good-looking, non-interactive scene into a mechanic that works. And the underwater portions? You know, every Mario Kart game has had sections where you could fall off the track, and I'm not saying 7 doesn't, but it's such a treat when you think you've irrevocably screwed up, and instead, there's an underwater course. These two elements take what were frustrating staples of Mario Kart and make them fun. Not only that, but they make the courses more varied than ever. Even more importantly, Mario Kart 7 finally righted the wrongs that had undermined the franchise's gameplay for nearly a decade. While it still has elements of luck, it no longer seems like such a gamble. This wasn't something I noticed until I played 7 right after the Wii version, but it is so, so much more solid. In Wii, racing sometimes felt like you were a ball in a pachinko machine. Your skill or lack thereof mattered a little, but you were very much subject to the whims of the item system. Mario Kart 7 features awesome courses, new innovations that stick, and finally balances the struggle between skill and chaos that had come to define Mario Kart. I'm not saying there won't be occasions when a race's outcome is changed by a blue shell, but blue shells have been nerfed pretty hard, and powerful items in general don't seem nearly as common. Randomness can still make things interesting, but for the first time in a very long time, skill can usually overcome it. With that, Mario Kart 7 is my pick for the best game in the franchise. It came out pretty early in the 3DS's lifespan, and right around the same time as other big games for the system. So I think this might be one a lot of people missed out on. If you're in that boat, I highly recommend you check it out. 64 will always be my personal favorite, but purely as a game, 7 trumps them all. Well, it does for now anyway. Everything I've seen and read about Mario Kart 8 suggests that it'll be building on everything that made 7 so solid. It feels good to say that for the first time since 2003, I can't freaking wait for the new Mario Kart. I'll be doing a detailed critique of that new Mario Kart in the next week or two, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't so you won't miss it. If you like the video, then like the video. If you like the Geek Critique, like us on Facebook. And as always, you keep geeking, we'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching.